Hello, Image Muse, and welcome to another Muse Talk. I am Kurt Humiller. Uh, before we get started, uh, we wanted to say hello to any new members to Image Muse. We've had a, a number of new signups in the past couple months. We currently have over 1,060 uh, members. Uh, Image Muse is a discussion group that strives to share knowledge related to the various challenges around uh, imaging, asset management, and publishing in cultural heritage institutions such as libraries, museums, and archives. Uh, there are currently five moderators uh, that maintain Image Muse who are all in uh, this uh, chat right now. Um, Daniel Dennehy from the Minneapolis Institute of Art or MIA, uh, John French from the Yale University Art Gallery, Melissa Fournier at the Yale Center for British Art, Robert Kassler from MoMA, and I'm Kurt Humiller from MoMA. Um, Image Muse is free to join. We receive no sponsorship and we have strict rules prohibiting the use of the forum for soliciting business. On to that. Um, in order to keep everything going smoothly today, please keep your microphones muted unless you're called upon. Uh, please at the bottom, uh, click the chat button to make sure the chat window is open. Um, it's a, a great way to share information, ask questions. Uh, we encourage that if you have additional experience, this is can be a bit of a discussion. Um, so uh, feel free to share there. Um, uh, the, uh, if you, uh, the moderators will be monitoring the chat during the discussion uh, um, and any questions brought up when we get to the Q&A section, we'll bring those up. Um, if uh, we need further clarification, we may call on you to uh, uh, clarify any further questions. Uh, we are recording this discussion and plan to post it later online. Feel free to ask questions uh, during the presentation, but we'll hold uh, them till the Q&A session after all three presentations are complete. Uh, Tadeki, we're lucky to have a group of three five-minute presentations from Image Museum members and contributors around the topic of lighting. First up, uh, we, uh, Tawny has a presentation uh, titled uh, The Power of Directional Light. Tawny Louise, uh, Tawny Louise Krakakola um, is the lead photographer at the J. Paul uh, Getty Trust. Uh, uh, as uh, art, uh, an Art Center College of Design alumni with over 22 years uh, in the industry, Tawny brings her three-dimensional lighting expertise, unique artistry and production uh, experience to her role. She manages the studio at the Getty Village, uh, trains photography crews, and establishes best practices and quality standards for publication, promotional material, and conservation photography. Before joining the Getty in 2006, Tawny worked uh, in production for the Walt Disney Company, publishing worldwide, and as a production editor for the Rand Corporation. Tawny, please take it away. Hey, thank you, Kurt, and uh, to the industry's family for this opportunity today. Uh, at the Getty, we take such great pride in the work that we do and we enjoy sharing our process within this community. So thank you for having us. All right, so today we are going to talk about the power of directional light. And I was lucky enough in the Villa studio to have the opportunity to photograph Pepe Foros. And this is a sculpture here the legacy shot here on the left of showing how we used to light back in the day for conservation, left, right, flood. As you can see, there's not much shape and form. Then the uh, graphic design team does a mock-up of what it would look like in the galleries, and we're still not getting really the form of this, of this object like we should. We're not really seeing the shape. And on the far right here, you see what we do in the studio, and, uh, the power and the magic of uh, directional light. So I'm going to just show my process here and capture one. I felt like this was the easiest way. It's like, welcome to the studio. And uh, uh, I always start at uh, base characteristics per curve at film standards. So I get the most power of seeing my highlight. And then I will keep my levels and everything pretty much zeroed out until I build my light up so I can see what my light is doing. So you can see now pretty flat overhead light directional, yes, but not really the direction I want. So I'm gonna start moving around and just show you my process. Uh, 
this is me just building in light. And once I figure out my main light on the top, I'm going to start building in to get that leg to show up. And so I'm breaking light from the left and the right to create shape and form. Hopefully I'm not going too fast here. So building up the light here. And I'm really using the power of my packs. So you're going to see that big jump right there. I'm not playing again with any of these exposures or dynamic range yet. I'm just using my pack power. And I haven't blown, right? I've got my exposure comp uh, up here, my warning. I haven't blown my highlight, which is a good thing. And I'm keep going, building that light in and moving around. So you can see that big jump right there. That's me moving my light over to give some more directional light to bring out the power of that leg. And so again, we're storytellers, right? What is the story of this object? So big jump here for time's sake is to see like the real craft of light for, from here to here, feeling that power of that, that light coming over her right shoulder. And then I'm playing around, I've got the luxury of no face, right, no head, so I can have a lot of fun here moving the light around and trying to uh, get that top area to go fall, fall backwards. And then this, what I'm showing here is I like to turn off all my lights and just see real quick, where's the direction coming from and am I getting the, the look and shape that I want for my shadows and my highlight? So a lot of times I'll turn off everything, take, check it, turn off everything the other side, check it, and then bring on my, my flood at the top where my, now it's become my fill, right? And uh, it's a little bit more play here, um, bringing in a reflector, which I am um, a slave to, <laughs> and uh, still crafting that light, moving around, bring it forward. Now some more reflectors in the front to bring out that chin and her leg, a little bit more definition and finding that. A little change shape at the top. And then LCC, because I'm using IQ 180 here, so a little old school on the Hossi block body color. Final. And then I'm going to show you my setup. So in this particular setup, uh, a little bit more lights than I normally would use, so I have to put in that caveat. But this particular object, because she's made of stone, she really needed some more light because she was absorbing a lot of light. So I've got these awesome strip, bronze strip lights that I love. Um, they take up two slots on that power pack, so you gotta watch out for that if you don't have enough power, but you have a lot of control. And then I'm using Pico uh, boxes up here, not normally what I would use because it's really widespread, but it works for her. And then you scrim off some of my light here, so I'm getting a little bit better fall off. Uh, and then lastly, I wanna show you, sometimes I'll shoot my final where I'm at, and I feel real good where I'm at. And then I'll push it a little bit farther and play a little bit more. So you'll see here on um, the, the difference between these two, I wanted to bring out the collar of the peplum. And I also wanted to bring out this left shoulder. And the reason for that is because the directional lighting I was having on the left image here was all coming over her right shoulder. And I felt like her left shoulder was like falling back and it looked like her bodice was twisting. And so I brought in that second Pico box to bring it in so that I could pull that shoulder forward and give more shape in her bodice and her breast area. And uh, I felt like, all right, I'm gonna land here. And that's where I ended up. And that's it. That's my little talk on directional life. And uh, on to the next. Thank you, Tony. Perfect timing, actually. Um... <laughs> Uh, next up, Kevin Camlin is photographer at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, overseeing the image services department. He works with almost all departments uh, and their very visual needs. He came to the museum in 2015, allowing, to him apply, uh, allowing him to apply his expertise in object lighting, staging, and digital production. Previously, his studio created tabletop, food, and interior photography for editorial, catalog, and advertising clients. Uh, receiving a BFA from the School of the, Art, uh, uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute, he now understands why he took all those required art history classes. Kevin, please take it away. That was good timing, Tony. I hope I can follow that. Um, so, I'm really meaning this just to be an introduction or at least a conversation starter about different types of light, because as we all know, there's so many different ways to do it. There's a joke I remember, how many photographers does it take to screw in a light bulb? 
And it's one to do it and nine to say, I could have done that. So I want to follow right into that because there's so many ways to do this. And this is really more about a conversation. So this is an existing photograph of a Bodhisattva. It's a great photo, but the resolution is kind of lacking. Color is pretty good. Um, we're doing a, a new exhibition on gender and this is included. So I thought this would be a good uh, example of how I deal with some things. I'm a big fan of a top light. It always, it always works for me. It's a good place to start from as Tanya also did. But not everything works that well this way. So for instance, in this case, we have, um, he's really dark underneath. There's not enough shadow underneath. There's not, it's just not enough definition. And so when I turn objects, I need to be able to light them different ways. And that's why I often go to the top. But in this case, it's just not gonna work. So we have a third eye here, which is an excellent way for me to, to kind of demonstrate the different types of light. So that'll be my starting spot. And that'll probably be my fill in the end. Um, oops, sorry about that. So here we go. I was gonna go real simple, go through the different lighting sources. Can you, that's right, that's covered up, thanks. So in this case, we have our bare bulb. I put a diffusion, it's just my instinct. I wish I hadn't, so you could really just see how harsh this would be. Quality of light is a funny term because it's, it's, it defines broad to point source from a foggy day in San Francisco to a, a bright sun you know, in an evening. Um, I don't know which is quality, the broad, the broad light or the point light. So, that's the conversation I'd love to have. Um, so here we go. It's it's okay, but it's a bit much. It's kind of unwieldy. I have a hard time thinking about how I'd work with that light. Um, let's go to the next one, which would be your seven inch reflector, which everybody seems to have some form or another. It's pretty nice, but it's pretty similar with the same problem where it just kind of, it's just the background is, which is always important to me, just doesn't seem to have much going on. Um, I don't do this kind of demonstration. I kind of go to one thing pretty often, but I always do check it out. In this case, there's a strip light, which I like because of the definition, you can throw the light pretty nicely. But I'm not crazy about this reflection, but I do see, I do see how I can work with this. I like the background, but if I was to have to move this light at all, it would change everything. And I know I can't do a lot of different variations or different rotations of the object with this too easily. So that's a problem for me. Um, let's go on to the next one. So here's a grid with, here's a softbox without a grid. It's pretty broad. It's a bit cruel sort of in its intensity. And uh, I just have a problem with seeing a reflection that gives away my light source. It's just my own little perverted thing there. Where I don't like letting anybody know how I did it. Um, and then we have a beauty light, which a lot of people have. And I'm a big fan of beauty lights. This is a uh, pretty large uh, pro photo. It's white, not silver on the inside. It has a great background, but it's really unwieldy. And as you can see in, over here, it, it really goes across the entire room. It's, it's too big for this room. It's too big for this piece. So I will probably not use that. Um, and then here's the same looking through a, a half diffusion. It's really nice light. I mean, it's, I, I think it's, it shows a lot of detail. It rolls off nicely. The highlights aren't blown. So I like it a lot. And I use it up in the galleries. It's with a lot of the stone that I have. It's, it's unpolished stone or, excuse me. It's really difficult to get definition out of some of the granite or sandstone. So this light does a great job of that. It puts an edge on everything, but it's too big. Um, now here's a light that was given to me or left me by my predecessor, uh, Ka Saruda. And um, it has no name on it. I don't know who manufactured it. It's a small beauty dish. And I've come to really love this thing. Um, and it puts a nice little highlight on there. And I'm able to sort of direct it. As you can see, it's not brutal. It doesn't spill too far. So it's really good for a lot of the, our collection, which kind of is about you know one foot to three feet to four feet. Um, and so I've decided to go with that. So you know, here's your top light only. This is with some of the, uh, the causes, I call it the cause light coming in, pump it up a little bit. And I'm starting to get something with some definition that I can turn around and actually show the detail on the bottom of the pedestal, which was really kind of lacking before. Um, so that's, it's really a nice definition for me. So zooming out and I just kind of go through my next steps, which are to fill different spots, do a little bit of backlight and bring it in there. And I can shoot different rotations by moving the lights a little bit. And I can, I can kind of get my different side rotations. 
I didn't mention before that I like shooting through a scrim for the top light. Um, you can't see it there because of the black card for blocking uh, for, or flagging for flare, but I just like shooting lights through softening devices. It just gives me that sort of, I don't know how to explain it, foggy day, living in San Francisco, I guess. I don't know, but I, I like that. So let's see here. That is the stacked version. As you can see, it's a little crispy because of the stacking, but I like, I like it, it works. And people can see in the details and the shadows and yet it still has a direction of light. So that's what I've been doing. And I'm open to any suggestions going forward. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, last but not least, uh, Charles Walbridge is lead collections photographer at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, also known as MIA. Uh, he has worked at MIA for more than 15 years. Uh, the work he does includes still photography, 3D scanning, conservation photography, and environmental sustainability. Before joining MIA, Charles worked as an advertising photographer and a photojournalist. Take it away, Charles. Uh, thanks, Kurt. Hi, I'm, I'm Charles. Uh, thanks, uh, Image Musers and and uh, and Tony and Kevin. Um, we wanted to do this different one because it's different from what um, what Tony and Kevin talked about. We're talking about um, art documentation in the in the galleries. Um, so, if you don't know, Mia is a um, an encyclopedic institution, uh, uh, art museum in the heart of Minneapolis, and it looks like this in the summer. And it looks like this inside when we're not closed to the public. And it definitely looks like this, you know, a, a lot of the time. And then this is how I like to think of it. Uh, my daughter's the cute one in there. Our Southeast Asian galleries, um, there are three of them that are devoted to, to Southeast Asian art. And they were closed in the fall of 2018. I'm sorry, 2019. And they were remodeled and reopened in October of this year when, when the museum was still open to the public. We got to bring lots of the art to the photo studio for new photography and for 3D scanning, which uh, was a great opportunity for us. Um, this ceremonial swan is new to us and it wasn't conserved and fully assembled before the galleries reopened. Um, and our curator wanted its primary photo, um, the one that's on the website and first in our collections database, uh, to take advantage of the new gallery colors. Um, we do most of our object photography here in the studio at MIA, but uh, sometimes we make exceptions. And when we do gallery photography of art objects, we have lots of choices. You know, we can use gallery lights, we can use studio lights, and we can use our cannons, or we can use our phase one cameras. Um, you know, really, we'll do whatever we can to get pictures onto our website. And so I took a couple hours one afternoon uh, when the museum was closed to uh, go up and take pictures. And so I took uh, all this gear up from the studio uh, to the galleries um, on our freight elevator. And uh, so this messy setup is a, is a Mac Pro with an external data drive and our FOBA stand and our C stands and reflectors. And um, that's our phase one uh, IQ 180. Um, we also have three brown color packs. One's got a nine inch reflector on it and two have two soft boxes each. Um, those are the stands we use for lighting paintings and you know big folding screens. And they're really easy to bring to the galleries even if I don't use them in that configuration. The, uh, the bottom soft box is actually attached to the same stand so it makes a good uh, light bank. So here's our situation in the gallery. You know, we, we can't get lights behind the object. Um, I'm trying to take about two hours to finish the whole thing. Um, there might be stuff in the way of the lights and, and the camera's best view, and we have to be cautious, of course. And um, essentially what I want to do with this photo is I want to know if I can do better than the gallery lights uh, with my studio lights. Um, so we have, as you know, a lot, a lot of limitations in the gallery. Um, I decided on this camera position from, uh, from my favorite view of the swan, um, uh, taking into account the gallery and, and what looks good for the swan. It's, uh, it's with an 80 millimeter lens on that, uh, on that medium format body. This is the straight gallery lighting and uh, that looks good for overall gallery photos, but I think when you get the object by itself, it, it, it's not great. So 
I started, this is the studio lights. Um, and I started with a light from above, just like Tani and, and Kevin do. Um, and I think it gives us a good base to work from. Uh, but here I've already added a fill softbox that's close to the camera. And then this is the same two lights uh, plus a nine inch reflector that's over there on our left. Um, I wanna get pretty close to my final light before I do a first white balance off of that X-ray card. Um, and this is, this is a good enough place for me to start. Um, I put the reflector there because I wanted to have separation between the beak and the crown of the swan. Um, but I found that I couldn't go too far around the other side. This is the same photo, but with no color card and cropped in a bit. Um, we'll come back to this photo in a minute. Um, so we've established our basic lighting with our main light coming from the reflector and our two soft boxes. One, one's in the ceiling. It's actually an open face soft box and one's from close to the camera. Here's what it looked like in the, in the gallery. Uh, here's one side of the lighting that we can fine tune. Um, the shadows on the swan in this photo are from the gallery lighting, of course. Um, but here we can see that I'm only using the softbox into the ceiling and the reflector with the barn doors on it from this side. Um, and the softbox that's pointed at the ceiling, I've actually taken the, uh, the diffusion face off. So it's an open face box, just, uh, just lighting the ceiling. I just store the, um, the face right there because it's Velcroed and it's not in the way. And then here's the other side of the gallery. Um, that first photo with studio lights showed uh, what this softbox that's close to the camera axis was doing for us. But then I actually ended up, and we'll get to these photos in a couple minutes. I ended up, um, I moved the softbox off of camera axis a bit, um, but I figured it was uh, a little easier to compare these two just to show how much I had moved that light. So this is essentially the same photo as before, uh, but it's cropped into the pedestal a bit more. And now I'm done uh, touching the camera unless I have to. Um, I wanna only trigger the camera from the computer so I can use different elements of multiple photos if I need to. And now the softbox that was close to the camera axis has moved away from the camera a few feet and uh, it, it took light off the crown and uh, kept the eye and the beak uh, and made them stand out more. Um, so this is before the softbox move and this is after the softbox move. So just uh, brighter on the swan's head and uh, what else did we see in there? Um, the shadow of the beak on the, uh, on the far side, I don't mind because um, on the far side of the crown, because it makes the beak stand out more. Um, and of course I turned up the, uh, the softbox. I made it just a little less contrasty. I turned it up three tenths of a stop. Um, this is our final image for the swan, but I really don't like the, the multiple shadows on the background. So I'm gonna go back and do a new exposure without the, without the nine inch reflector, with the nine inch reflector turned off. And I'm gonna use that as the background. So here's the same photo with no nine inch reflector, um, but we still have two shadows, but um, I think it's much less obnoxious. Um, so this photo plus the one before it uh, become our finished image for, that we're gonna use for, for this one. And I, I put those together in Photoshop with uh, pretty simple masks and I used the new um, Photoshop feature that's like select object or whatever it was. And it was, uh, it was reasonably good. It didn't take much, um, much extra work. Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, here's the finished studio lights photo uh, versus the, the original one that we did with gallery lights. Um, it took me a couple of steps to get to the finished gallery lights photo. And I have those in the next slides and only a couple slides left. So here's original gallery lights, and then I burned and dodged it in Photoshop just to make it better. If I could only do gallery lights, I would have ended up with a photo more like this. And as an experiment, I used the HDR sliders in Capture One and uh, ended up with that photo that's on, that's on your left. Um, and I don't like it, so I, would have, I, li I prefer the one with the gallery lights that I burned and dodged myself. Here's our very last slide. So this is... Um, Studio lights again, and, uh, and a composite, Im composite image, and our finished gallery lights. That's it. What do you all think? Thank you, Charles.
thank you, uh, Tony, Kevin, and Charles. Uh, kind of great presentations overall. Um, now we're going to open it up to Q&A and discussion. Um, Image Muse is a discussion forum. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, you probably have, uh, everybody has a raise their hand button. If you raise your hand, um, we can call on you uh, to, to ask a question, but also feel free to use the chat and raise questions there. Um, let's see here. Um, so I wanted to, uh, I'll start with Charles because he's fresh in my mind. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, compositing multiple views, yeah. you know, together, uh, you know, Tawny and Kevin kind of walk through getting the lighting in one shot. Um, question for all three, how often one, how often the other, and where do you draw the line between get it right in camera, like this, like that? Um, Charles, if you want to start. I'll start that one. In the studio, um, we try not to composite because it takes extra time. And, you know, we do multiple views of, of every object that we can. But with objects that are super glossy, you know, a really glossy vase or whatever, we might have, a, you know, a light that's giving us a really big highlight in one location. And then we'll do a photo with that on and a photo with that off and just take out that that super big highlight. And so we do really simple compositing like that. But we are... Um, often really production oriented here in the studio. And so um, we rarely take time to, uh, to spend more than a couple minutes in Photoshop with each of the images. Bonnie, do you wanna go? Um, so I think being an old school film photographer, <clears throat> I try to do everything in camera, um, but I'm learning as I get older <laughs> that, you know, I, I sometimes get frustrated when people say, just do it in post, just do it in post. But there are some things I'm learning that I can do faster in post. So um, if I'm doing a sculpture that is super complicated and um, there's one area, like an eye of a tiger, or you know, more like a lion, not a tiger for Villa, but um, I might just bring in my little reflector card and come in and literally just do a shot just for that highlight of that eye. And then I give it as a support file to um, to our post production team, and just be like, "Hey, put this, you know, put this in for the eye." And um, I find I've been doing that more than not um, because it's just so much faster. So I hope that answers that question. Sometimes I'll do that. Kevin. Yeah, for us, um, we do we do well focus stacking, we don't do it all the time, but when I do do it, you know, that's computation, that's, that's photography where you're doing versions. You know, I, I have a dislike of versions of versions because then you have to keep track of all that stuff. Um, but that said, I, you know, it's, I do think it's always beneficial when you can go in and, and help the background a little bit because for me, uh, a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional background is really all about separation. So. I will always light for the object and try to light for the background, you know, but it doesn't always work out the way I want. Um, and David Armstrong, who's our image specialist, he's been doing great. It's like, we don't even have to talk anymore. We just kind of know. And uh, I do, we do use the annotations in um, Capture One for saying, hey, could you work on this a little tiny bit? But like Charles said, it's production, you know, and we also do different angles. So I don't, we don't, I try to make it as simple as possible so that it can be done down the chain all the way and it doesn't have not, everything's not getting some sort of special treatment uh, but that said there's there's always something that comes up every object is unique that's my that's one of my sayings so yeah uh, it's a challenge keeping it simple uh tim do you uh want to ask your question yeah that'd be great uh, i'm just interested uh for any of the photographers uh if you happen to get uh, the reference color for the gallery photography for the uh, the painting um, so that you can match it uh, if it's really important to the curator uh, from your graphic design department. Just to be clear, are we talking about the, the wall paint? Uh yes, that's correct. Tim, I'm going to share my screen again for a minute and uh, hold on. This one. Um, 
These, uh, the answer, the quick answer is no. These um, galleries are the brightest ones that we have. This is, uh, this is unique to us and for in most cases, this is, a, this is a new direction for us. We would be, if one of our designers came to us and said, you know, this color is important for the design of this document, we would absolutely match it. You know, we would go back to these originals or rephotograph or whatever, but we aren't, you know, taking a reading off of a paint sample and matching that in here. We are, you know, just matching it visually. You know, we know this is a gray blue and not like you saw in those in those gallery lights, it's not a, a yellow blue. So, so the short answer is no. Great, thanks. Yeah. I'll step in on that one. Um, so we're the opposite at the Getty for the galleries, only because we've had so many issues where um, if they use like a wallpaper sometimes, or uh, the lights were in big transition at one point where there were a lot of tungsten and like lots of different, you know, lights coming in from every different angle of daylight from um, warm to cool to some sometimes fluorescence. <laughs> and so um, I've, been getting that Benjamin Moore swatch and we have like a set in the studio. So I just asked the designer, what, what did you use? They give us the numbers and tell me the color and I go and pull the swatches and cut them out and literally put them on our light tables and um, our viewing tables and compare color. Um, it seems a little fastidious, but sometimes a uh, green can flip to blue or, or vice versa, um, depending on what light source is in the space. So that's what we've been doing. Yeah, I have this watch book too, and I refer to it, but it, most no one's ever really come to me asking me like, why doesn't this look the same? But also I know the color temperature of the rooms, but that's been changing with us going to LEDs. So it's gotten a little, it's gotten a little woolly because we have a lot of different LEDs now and they all do things very different. Uh, they all react very differently, but yes, I have a swatch book for reference. Uh, Dan, you had a question? Yeah, I was just wondering in, you know, and people could answer in chat too, but the presenters primarily, like what strategies are you using for placing color targets um, in situations where, you know, there's multiple lights and uh, maybe there's not, you know, multiple light intensity. So I know for myself, I tend, tend to use like, uh, do like a, a, a session um, shot with the target right in the middle and then take it away and but I'm wondering if what other people are doing for that. Of course, there's no kind of like real good foggy guidelines for 3D work. So um, just wondering how people are dealing with that. I'll step in here. Um, I try to put I try to put a color card in every Buddha's hand. That's my goal. Um, and I do. It's got to be in the center. It's it to me. I, so I actually have a CC image of every single shot. It's my final. It's always right in the middle of the shot. And, I, and we store it. I keep it. And it's really important to me. And 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 if it's a difficult thing, I'll actually put two cards, one up high and one down low, so that there's actually something showing what the bottom of the set looks like and what something at the top of the set looks like. And yeah, I do use this. I use those small, um, small ones that are really handy. But I, I make sure they're, that they're facing the camera, that they're catching the light. And I wish there was a little better standards on this. I know they're targets, right? They're supposed to help you. They're targets. They're not bullseyes. Um, but um, yeah, it's really important to me. And it's not off to the side. It's got to be right in the middle of the object. So much so that that's the only thing you see. And uh, I don't know. It's to me, it's a it's a religion, you know, that I have to have it. One footnote on that: there was an image I did once that I forgot to put a color card in. It had been recently cleaned, and the collectors, I mean, not the collector, the conservators, uh, sorry, the curator said, "That's not my object." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, it is. We cleaned it. It's not brown anymore. Now it's rest. It's now it's ochre." And she's like, "That's not it." And I did not have an issue, an image with a color card in it, and I got burned. And I will never make that mistake again. Uh, Tony or Kevin, anything to add on that or? I'm just ditto. Miss oh, Anto, sorry. Um, Hold on, Kurt. I thought I had something. Um, with, and I'm going to share my screen one more time. I just called up this one image. Um, so in the studio, I like to 
color balance early in the process and then color balance late in the process after all of the lights are are balanced and i will face it towards camera but in this case in the um in the gallery i were i really wanted to know what color i was getting off of the ceiling you know the ceilings in here are ostensibly white but there's a lot of light bouncing around and so i wanted to uh angle the card up into that with um you know a very close approximation of what my final lights were going to be We also had uh, uh, questions. Uh, one talking about elements. Do you save the raws for each element when you do that? And two, do you save raws at all? Some people say the tip is the final representation or what. So, um, Tawny, then Kevin, then Charles. So, Kurt, you're asking, do we save the the sessions or do we well, save? Well, sessions or raw files, however you do it. If you're not in Capture One, do you just save the raw files? And if you have, if you are doing multiple elements, are you saving, yeah. How, how, how do you save archive? What isn't the final tip? Do you, do you throw it out? Do you save, what do you save? So I think we're still building those standards because I think every photographer's kind of um, over legacy has kind of done something a little different. So we're trying to kind of get everybody together where we're, um, we'll save the, the session on something that we're shooting that's strictly for conservation where we're doing like pre-conservation or what we call before treatment, during treatment, and then after treatment. And I like to have that same session and carry it through. And sometimes it could be a couple of years later that they conserve something. We do the, the post-conservation work. So I like to save those raws. And sometimes I even like to work in the same session. Um, and, but historically what we do is once we process out our raw and, cam and capture one and come to go to a TIFF, that TIFF then becomes our archive file. And that um, is not seen by the museum at large. It goes into our dam system, but we do an access file that is um, an eight, usually an eight bit that will be more accessibly used. But that archive file, and Todd can speak to this, Becky Bear Martinez can speak to this. Like we, we save that and um, have that as the archive file. So um, sometimes we'll go back to the capture one if it's saved, but not all, we don't always save it. So I hope I answered that question right. Well, I thought this was a lighting. I thought we were talking about lighting. Um, <laughs> um, so Inevitably, the question comes still, This is a whole can of worms, you guys. Seriously, guys and gals. I mean, so when I came in, we no one had saved RAWs, and there had been some bad contamination of a lot of images through various mishandling, and we all wished we had some RAWs to go back to. And so as a result, uh, Robert Warren is here. He can speak to that. Um, we all, we, we squirreled away all these raws just in case because we saw what happens if you don't. Um, so we are, and, and we are saving our raws, although I will be the first to say we've probably only gone back to them once or twice, if that. Um, so that's something that's on my list to re-examine. Uh, Rx, we, so that's, that's pretty much that. Um, and I'd like what Tony said about saving them for whenever you did a post conservation and be able to match that. That's pretty interesting to me. Um, yeah, that's my, the jury's out on my in my full view on the whole subject. I'm not I'm not quite convinced either way. I'm done. So to answer Robert's question, the um, all the images that we use for compositing, we save. We usually save them as raws. We seldom save the Photoshop documents that we build up, you know, cause they're usually 16 bit and you know, they're a gig and a half and you use, you know, a, a thousand pixels from whatever, um, whatever layer you had. And so we have the EIPs, we save all of those. Um, we have a metadata tag um, for Photoshop composite, uh, both on the final image and on the, um, on the component image. And then, um, but we don't save that intermediate Photoshop document pretty much ever. Um, we always save our raw files. We're still saving them as EIP because the EIPs and the, which is the capture one raw file. Um, the, when you convert to DNG out of um, capture one, which we would, 
do in an ideal world, the, the DNGs are totally different from the EIPs that we're getting out of Capture One. And we're really confident that Capture One is going to be around for a long time and we'll be able to go back to those EIPs. And we have, you know, for catalog work, um, particularly with prints and drawings, we've gone back to um, pictures from five and 10 years ago and reprocessed them with, with our new, uh, you know, the new Capture One processing engine or maybe sometimes in camera raw as well and gotten better images out of those, out of those raws. And so we are always saving those EIPs as well as the component pieces for, um, you know, when we composite images. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to add something to that is um, I, 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 I was shown that EIPs are just zip files. You can open up with any zip extractor and the raw file is in there. So the, all the adjustments are just, it's a wrapper. So yeah, the, the camera raw is proprietary, but the EIP itself is not proprietary. Uh, let me uh, reframe the question. Um, maybe Kevin, you like this question a little bit better. Um, how, how are you defining the look and the style of the image? Because you're, you're, you're doing that in concert with possibly a, a, a curator um, or institutionally you have a style guide. So you're building up all of these elements to create a style. So how do you, maybe you could address how do you come up with your style, your look? Well, I think it's a good question. It's one that I constantly ask myself every week. Um, I, I kind of work alone. I do work, you know, with curators and I do work with publications and stuff. And I work with my, I work with David Armstrong, my image specialist. And, um, you know, the color card is, is like our first place, which is where's the density and where's the highlight. And that's, you know, then the curves, you try to keep those from being out of control. Um, as far as style goes, I try to photograph similar objects similarly. And, you know, I know some other institutions, they do things by the publication. Um, and I sometimes I wish I had that ability because often I'm photographing something. I don't realize it's for something bigger till later, um, which I don't like. But yeah, you, you're bringing up a really big question. And it's, it's one that uh, I, I wish I had more consensus on from an institutional level and, and also maybe even a, a larger, but, and this kind of goes to photographing three-dimensional objects. I mean, 2D has been fairly well straightened out. It's been pretty well laid out. There's a lot of tools out there. There's the creativity that I see that I have is, is how much gold I let bounce off of an illuminated manuscript or something. But other than that, I don't well, 3D is a whole different ball of wax and you're, you're apps, you bring up a huge one and I wish I could answer it a little more clearly. Um, but I, I try to keep it from, be, from anything being an outlier. Does that make sense? Where, you know, they look good, to, they look well together. Sorry, I'm not being more definitive. To build on that for, for everyone, one kind of musing that I've had over the years is that, you know, I was at a museum that was much older collection and I'm at now a modern art collection. And my limited experience between those two museums is that older, you know, classical busts or, or you know, 17th, 18th century bust might need a little more drama, a little more, you know, the light is a little more forward, a little more pronounced. And modern art, the photographers don't work less. They still have to work their butts off to make it look like it's not lit. <laughs> um, because you don't, with a modern or contemporary piece, you don't want the light to overshadow it. Does, is that, that's my musing. I don't know if, if you uh, have similar feelings or lighting changes by collection. Well, for my two cents, we're collecting contemporary art now, and it is, it is exactly that, where it, it's not about the light. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's about the evenness of the light and fidelity of color. And, and of course, they're larger pieces, so they're more challenging. <laughs> I was hoping to Tony. expand upon that. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, Tony, Tony, go ahead. Well, Tim, I saw your I saw your comment there in the chat, and I was I mean, just kind of combined with what Kurt's asking. And um, you know, the Getty, there's a lot of legacy of many years of shooting left, right, flood that we were talking about earlier. And I was wondering, is it okay if I share my screen real fast? Because I, I have a case in point that I wanted to bring up, 
And um, you see here, this is Hermes. This was an object that came to us from Santa Barbara. And on the left is the where the curator and the conservator had asked me to stop when we were shooting, when they were on set with us. And they said, that's it, that's exactly what we want. And I said, really, that's where we're gonna end up? And they were like, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. And I said, okay, so I shot final there. And then I said, now I'm gonna do it my way, okay? And, um, and, and then we can talk about it. So then I changed the light and moved it and I did what's on the right. And a week or two later, I had them both come to the studio and I put them both up on screen and I said, all right, guys, we're finalizing this. Which image do you want? And they both said, oh, the one on the right, the one on the right. And I said, why? And they said, well, because there's more definition. I see the piece better. I see shape and form. And I also can still see into the shadows. I can see you know, what's going on where the piece is more three-dimensional. Makes more sense. And I said, well, do you realize that the one on the left is the one where you want to stop? And, and we have this conversation a lot. And, and I think sometimes the curators and conservators, they, they're not photographers. They don't kind of see the light the same way we do. And I think in this situation, it is not for studying the stone. And it's more about, I mean, even you can study the stone on the one on the right too. But after we had this experience together, now we shoot everything kind of more like what's happening on the right here. And that is what they both prefer because they now see the difference. So I just wanted to bring that up real quick because I think this is a good case in point of of why as photographers and artists that using directional lighting and, and just lighting to show shadow kind of tells a better story of what everybody needs. So I just, I just want to put that out there. That's a great example, Tony. Um, one question I kind of have um, for all three, and because Image News is a wide group of people, many of us have to deal with works on paper. There's a lot of people who are, you know, Fadgy three star pounding through on copy stand and such. And I've discussed with some of those people, like, I like the 3D stuff, but how much time does it take? So for each object that was presented today, about how long did the lighting process take for, e for each of you, Tawny, Kevin, then Charles? So, so Peppa Flores took a long time. So I would lie if I was like, oh yeah, it took me a couple hours, but it, it took me a a solid day to light her for main view for the view for the one main view of front and then once i got that in place and this i think this happens a lot right we used to talk about that a lot where you take you know, it takes so long for the setup and then the shot takes two seconds but um then the next day i shot all views all around because once i perfected that light then i could speed through the rest and you know she was rather big and complicated but usually i would say two to three hours to get to that main view for most objects that aren't as complicated as public floros. Um, and that still might break the, <laughs> break the timeline for most institutions. And how many views was on that second day? Second day, I knocked out nine views. So, you know, because there was a couple of details in there. Um, so yeah, once you get that main view and get that, then you really are there, then you might just have to move a little bit here and there. And you know, Beck, Becky can, I have some of my uh, colleagues, I can see their beautiful faces. Um, so they know, you know, that first day is a struggle. And then after that, it's sort of like, all right, boom, 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 we've got this. Yeah, so for me, I, I'm still struggling sometimes to be able to shoot a lot of similar objects in the same day. Um, but that's that's not the need. The needs are different. They're more varied. But generally, on that piece, I. I did uh, maybe four, six views. Once I got the lighting worked, I only had to move the lighting a little bit and overall views. And then I do some close ups and some details. So maybe two, three hours. Um, but it depends on the on the importance of the piece. I will spend a lot more time on a piece that I know is, is conceived as very important to the institution. And I will. And also, if I have to turn it over or get marks or stuff like that. So there's all those. The handling is always the issue. Um, but. Um, With that, uh, with that swan in the gallery, I was uh, in the galleries for about two hours. I did do multiple views of it um, with, you know, the lighting I had established. Actually, when I went to the other side of the swan, I moved the, the hard light, the ref light from the reflector to the other side. Um, so I did a similar image that was the opposite view as long as I had the lights up there. But I was only up in the galleries for, for two hours. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the time we have. So if I, it was that or... Nothing, you know. Well, 
Kurt, I see in the chat um, a great question from Tony uh, Siegel about um, documenting your set before you, you know, if you've got something months apart, how do you document your set so that you can kind of repeat that later for after treatment that you did before treatment, you want to match your lighting. And um, as you saw there, I mean, Kevin has this practice too. I know Charles is too, we do set shots. Set shots, I think, are absolutely imperative. I think that they should be mandatory <laughs> in every studio. I think every lead photographer should ask their crew to do set shots. And I actually, um, have you guys ever heard of chat books? And uh, I don't know if you know this, it's, it's, a, it's an app that you can put on your phone. And I like to do my set shots with my cell phone. I used to use a Nikon in the studio and it was like got the card and the whole thing. And I, you know, it was time consuming. But with my cell phone, I just boom, boom, boom. And then later at home, I'm laying in bed and I literally select all my set shots and I send it to chat books as a book. And they literally build me a book of every set shot like I've done for that month and it dates it. And then I just take my book into the studio and I like remember what I was shooting and then they're like reference right there. And then I just have it. So it's, it's a tip. Donnie, can we get copies of that? Uh, that's funny. Maybe. Five dollars a pot. <laughs> I don't do it enough, I confess. It's a, uh, I don't, I don't know why, but I just don't. Um, and at our, for our conservation imaging, which is actually at a different little nonprofit that's here in the building, um, the before and after treatment imaging is a very simple setup that's uh, always repeated. All right, we're getting towards the end here. Any last chance for questions or uh, anyone I ask Tony where we can uh, purchase her set books from? So I'm, I'm gonna ask a question and, and I'll say thanks to Image Muse and, and the, all, the, all the moderators for making this happen. And Tony, thank you for the idea of getting us to, asking us to do this and getting us all together. Um, but I guess one question I have then is, um, and everybody's going to have their own style and clearly, you know, there's been a lot of attempts and some very successful kind of uh, creating styles within an institution, but is there aside, you know, we have our color cards, but other than that, what else do we have? I guess that's the kind of the open-ended question. And also if anybody wants to tell me about some other light modifiers that I can play with, because I, I'm always looking for inspiration. But um, yeah, I, I, how, how do we make three-dimensional artwork? You know, we're obviously having an image going, you know, it's, it's become more standardized. It's not green velvet anymore. It's not blue velvet anymore. Things have changed, but where are we going? I guess is the next question. Where are we going and how are we gonna get there? While we do that, I'm gonna ask every photographer in, the, in here, in the chat, put your one modifier you cannot live without into the chat. But yeah, it is an absolute challenge to try and standardize 3D photography um, because like we kind of said, there's different styles of it and, and there are things where you want it more dramatic. And honestly, if we were to make a standard, that shot that Tony said, the curator said, stop at might be closer to it, but we all see the value in what Tony created after that. So that's the, the hard line. Oh. Kevin, I think by the time that we actually get to where you're talking about getting to, there'll be massive actual 3D digitization where you capture the model accurately and all of the post-production is done by a post-production team. So they relight it infinitum as needed. Um, I guess, and I'm gonna go crazy here, it's what's, you, you light your own 3D model, right? To your own taste. Um, I suppose that would be the, all the way at the other end. But, you know, it's what, it's what Tony's example showed that people don't know what they don't know. 
Um, so they don't know how to see. I, I also had a curator come on set and we did a bunch of bronzes and I and he was so happy. And I was like, this is so flat. <laughs> and he was overjoyed. And I was like, oh, I, and I, you know, I could not talk him out of it. So that was that, you know, and that there's always that element. I just want to point that I absolutely love this group because I'm looking at a list of names and I know the studios have millions of dollars of lighting between them and everybody loves foam core, white bounce cards and foam core. <laughs> you, you guys know, you guys know about light rights, right? Does everybody know about magnetic reflectors made by light right? He's this guy in the middle of nowhere making these amazing reflectors. And um, he's going out of business. He's been in the commercial business for 50 years. He's an amazing man, old guy, retired now. And he just moved and he's getting rid of his product. Oh. So you guys should check it out and go to the website. They are, they are priceless. I, I put it in the chat. Absolutely essential in our studio. Ugh. Hi, Andy. I, I caught a question go by a while back from Todd Swanson um, that I was curious about myself. Is anyone using color correction filters on their lights as modifiers to match temperatures or we pass that? We're, Robert, we're uh, measuring our soft boxes every now and again to see how yellow they're getting. And um, we have on a couple of our older soft boxes, we have you know, blue gels inside them so that they so that they match each other, um, and we find that they're close enough. They're five thousand fifty two hundred. They're close enough to um, to the open face reflectors that that they're all the same. But when, especially on the background with that one overhead one on the on our little tabletop set, if that one didn't have uh, blue CCs in it, it would uh, it would it's really noticeable on the background. So yes. Yeah, he's absolutely right. That, that is a big deal. And I know when I was a commercial shooter, I did a catalog and I did not check my boxes and the film came back and I was horrified and it looked terrible and I will never make that mistake again. So uh, yeah, uh, you know, a color meter is actually a really nice thing. They're around, you know, but you also do it digitally nowadays, but it's, it's a great thing to check. Um, and, you know, I, I, my only advice is that when you're using a bunch of boxes going forward is you can get a bunch at the same time. That way they all age at the same pace. It's a big deal. And Andy. Scoros um, pack in, in yours, uh, Charles, and are you adjusting color temperature on the pack to help compensate for any discolorations um, in the material in the softbox? Is that possible? Our, our brown colors do not have that fancy adjustment. Um, so we, uh, we are just doing it with a color temperature meter and, um, and blue gels in this case. Yeah, a the lot highest... cheaper than the, yeah, a lot cheaper than the, uh, what, $14,000, $15,000 Scoro EPAC now? Yes, yes. But, but Robert, uh, we do that, Robert. Um, like those Pico boxes are very blue. And then the the Chimera soft boxes are really warm. So if I throw a Pico box on and mix, I can see that blue light. So I will um, change the color temperature of just that pack for that light. But you can't mix. I mean, you can't, right? On the same pack, the separate slots, you can't do one or the other. It's like all or nothing, right, on that pack. And then you have to remember that if you turn it off and turn it back on again, it'll go back to like, so if you leave for lunch and turn your pack off and then come back, you better remember to go fix that temperature again, but it, but it's useful. Uh, Andy uh, mentioned, uh, I believe uh, you're, you're using uh, at the um, uh, Corning Museum, uh, they're using uh, LEDs and one advantage of LEDs now is, is that many of them are, are tunable. Um, do you have any comments on how they're working out for you or? Yeah, we use a mixture of, um, we have the brown color LED F-160s. We use a, another source of frac light, um, which we primarily use actually in soft boxes. We use Chimera. Um, and then we use Dado light uh, by color. 
um, LEDs as well, mostly for uh, the beam spreads, but each one of them has their own sort of characteristics. And we will use a color meter and read the different ones and adjust. Um, the, the brown colors have sort of the best with that green magenta tint adjustment, whereas the other ones just have a broad color adjustment. So we do, we set up different profiles for different sort of sets of lighting. With 3D lighting, I mean, it's not like doing the color card where you can do even lighting and, and establish it, but we will when we have, like, we know a group of lighting and we really will sort of build a profile for those combinations and try to get the sources as close as possible. Um, continuous lighting is a big advantage for being able to adjust color over strobe or power pack. Um, in our case, uh, shooting glass most of the time, continuous light has lots of other advantages of really being able to control and see beam spreads. But um, I, I kind of believe that, especially as LEDs are becoming more powerful with the soft boxes and everything, we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, and with daylight, you can actually start to combine strobe and LED if you, if you want. But again, the color um, so far between the brown color and the dado, they've been really color stable. The practical light, we get a little more variation, especially toward the edges of the beam. Um, and so what we try to do that with those is really use them more in soft boxes, full flood. Um, that's where we really notice the, the weakness of the color variation is when you start to spot down and you get a little bit of color fringing. I don't know if that answers your full question. Great, thank you. <laughs> Well, um, I think that's, we're just over two o'clock. I'm gonna officially end the recording. I wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank our presenters uh, for uh, volunteering uh, and uh, being willing to uh, put themselves out there. I do feel this is a uh, very uh, important topic to photography because what we do is all about light. Um, and I have a feeling I'm going to try and rope Andy and a few others into doing maybe a similar talk down the road um, because I think this is something that there are a lot of things that we still have to solve. There is no standard in this area. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. <laughs>